Service of Illinois. Thanks very much. It's uh, really a, a, a pleasure to be here um, and, and talk about our experiences with Blue Waters a little bit. Um, I, I really need to point out that um, it's I've, I've got a, a really good team that, that's, that's been helping me on, on this. Um, Lance Hibbler is my uh, stress analysis PhD student who's just recently graduated and uh, he's being helped at NCSA by, by, by Sabe Korich, who's <laughs> The, the abacus expert around here. And I, I, I've got uh, two students, Kai Jin and Ray Liu, who are working on fluid flow in this process. And um, I also have a colleague, Pratap Vanka, who's been really helpful. Um, it's, it's really his code that we were using. Um, it's a GPU code and porting it to, to Blue Waters. And uh, he's, he's too modest. He didn't want to be a, a part of the official PIs. And, and uh, Ahmed Taha is our uh, help out, uh, helps out at, from, from, from NCSA to, to get this to work both our in-house fluid flow code and the commercial code fluent. So we've been looking at using some commercial codes that we've used on our workstations and see if we can get some good performance on Blue Waters from that. Um, the project that we're working on surprisingly has quite a bit in common with the previous talk on looking at climate modeling and weather but it's so much easier <laughs> because we're looking at steel continuous casting. So we've got this molten metal that we want to turn into a solid and we have to worry about turbulent flow and heat transfer and uh, stress analysis and making cracks and there, there are a lot of physical phenomena going on but um, uh, we, we still use these same computational tools that other people are using on blue waters. Um, one of the things that makes this worthwhile as this process is used to make 95% of the world's steel. It's about 1.4 billion tons a year. So even small incremental improvements to this process can have a fairly big impact on the efficiency of the process and the ability of steel companies to make better steel. It's a very harsh environment to conduct actual experiments. If you put in sensors to try to measure the fluid flow, they just dissolve in the molten steel. So, you, you, this is an ideal environment for computational models. You can measure a few things on the outside, and then you use those things to validate the models, and then you get the extra insight from the models to learn what's really happening on the inside. So some of the phenomena that we're worried about is a heat transfer, obviously that governs solidification. We've got multi-phase turbulent fluid flow. This governs the formation of inclusions. Um, uh, there's gas injected argon in order to control the flow and prevent clogging problems. Um, we've, uh, we've then got deformation and stress of this shell, crack problems, and there's things in the microstructure. So there's a lot of phenomena. But, so we've been focusing on, on three main tools for potential use on blue waters. First of all, Abacus, which is a Lagrangian based finite element uh, method code um, that, that simulates what's happening in the steel shell as it's moving. We have uh, two different fluid flow codes. Uh, both of them, of course, are Eulerian based and the flow goes through through the domain, finite difference method, the commercial code fluent, and our in-house code CU flow. A little bit about the stress analysis code. We've done a lot of macro scale analysis in, in the past, but one of the big problems in this uh, field is, is hot tearing and defects where we're pulling apart the dendrites on a microstructural scale. So we, we've been looking at this is a, 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 just a, a dendrite solidifying. We've got cold on the left and hot on the right. And uh, liquid films form between the dendrites and stresses pull that apart. And this is how cracks get formed. So if we want to really simulate the, the details of this so that uh, we can do something similar to the, the previous talk where we get the, all the understanding on, on a, a very tiny microstructural piece, and then take that knowledge and put it into the macro scale models. This is why there's a need for, for these, these micro scale models. Um, we we uh, can simulate the uh, temperature field is, is pretty uniform. 
So we're looking at the strain field, we're looking at the phase field, so this is the solid and that's the liquid, and then we're looking at, at, at the stresses, and, or you can say pressures that occur in here, and, and uh, as these shrink, we get stress and get high strain in the liquid. Um, unfortunately, um, our, our computational experience with this was not very good because um, Abacus implicit does not parallelize very well. And um, the, the explicit code that we were wanting to use cannot read in the multiple phase fields. So our, our speed ups are really not, not very impressive. So um, I, we're going to have to solve that problem before we can go further with Blue Waters on, on that project. But it, it still shows that it, it's, it's a fairly large problem. I mean, we could get two million degrees of freedom, and we uh, have, have quite a bit of uh, uh, work, work to do with that. Okay, a little bit about our uh, turbulent fluid flow code. Um, molten steel flows from a nozzle um, down into the mold. I'll show you this picture again. Here's this tun dish. This holds the molten steel. It flows through this nozzle into this water-cooled uh, mold, and then it solidifies a shell on the wall that is then pulled down at the, at the casting speed. And the flow pattern in here has a lot to do with quality problems. Any quality problem you make right at that top surface will end up in the steel right in the final product after you roll it and beat it. There's nothing you can do to get rid of that. So we need to focus on optimizing what's happening in fluid flow right in the mold. So this is our, our computational mesh. And this is not really a particularly challenging problem if what we want is the steady state flow pattern with the conventional turbulence model. But it's complicated enough that when you add in multi-phase gas injected, and then we want to know what, what's happening in a transient manner, um, it, it, it can become much more computational challenging, especially when we want to be accurate and take away those turbulence models and just do direct numerical simulation with a simpler model, just solve the Navier-Stokes equations. Turns out that's actually pretty accurate if you just solve the Navier-Stokes equations, but it's more computationally intensive. So this is an example of uh, flow pattern that we get. There's the steel flowing out of the nozzle, flows down in the mold, it goes up, and we're looking at this waves in the top surface because they're very important for, for quality. This is actually working fine, right? We've got some little waves, we can calculate that. And now if I move on, um, validation is a big part of this, so we can actually measure that top surface level with a sensor. And there's our prediction of the uh, those, those waves, and then we can see the measurements, which is the red line, match pretty well. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. Now the reason that we're interested in this transient behavior is we move on to a case where they, they had this, this dithering, and the, the frequency of the dithering happened to line up with the natural frequency of the tank, and then it starts to just slosh around. So that, this is a big commercial problem, and uh, we, we learned a lot using this model on that problem. So now we're looking at seeing how, how well does this do on blue waters. So we've looked at one of these uh, test problems, and uh, we're getting speed up here. If we look at like a 200 processors, we can get 100 times faster than our workstation. It's, a, it's about, um, it's even faster than that. The efficiency is like, like about 80% uh, speed up, which I think is really great. Um, and uh, if we compare it to our workstation, this, this kind of increase in speed, it takes like three months to do one of those simulations. Now you can get it done in a day. So that's, that's like a, a really big impact, especially because uh, Ray who, Liu, who's the student who's working on this, wants to graduate soon. And so he's trying to finish up a lot of these simulations, and so that's really helpful for him. So that, that's the second project. The, uh, the third project I just want to talk a little bit about is a uh, fluid flow with our, our in-house code, CU flow. And this is a GPU-based code that was really developed by Professor Pratap Vanka. And uh, one of the applications that we're using it for is to understand how the application of a magnetic field actually changes the flow pattern. So this is a, a commercial uh, trick where you, you put a, a magnetic field a, a, across the metal. And then as the steel is flowing, the, uh, the interaction of the field with the conducting steel generates a current that's about at 90 degrees to that. And then that uh, interacts with the, you know, the current itself interacts with the flow and then gener generates a force, which is another 90 degree rotation, which ends up being exactly opposed to the direction of the flow. So that's why they call it breaking, where you're applying this uh, field and, it's, and it 
opposes the flow. So it has this ability to stabilize the flow because the, the force is now proportional to the flow. So that's the concept, but it's a little more complicated than that in practice because you have conservation of momentum and things so that when you try to stop it, it'll just sort of go around and deflect and other things will happen. And again, it's hard to tell what's happening in the actual caster because we can't measure it. And it's hard to do uh, offline models with things like water because the uh, water is not magnetic. Water does have the same kinematic uh, viscosity as steel, so it's pretty good if you have non-magnetic flow. But, but with this magnetic situation, we, we really need to have our, our computational models. So here's a, some time average flow patterns. So we can see um, with no braking, we get this sort of double row flow pattern. The steel flows down and around, and, and it's a little bit asymmetrical. It's um, not supposed to be asymmetrical. It just, just means that we did not run our simulation long enough. I believe that uh, it, it, the uh, amount of time you pick, if it's long enough, you will get the expected effect. Um, but now when we apply the magnetic field, we uh, change the flow pattern quite a bit. We slow it down beneath and, and above, and this really changes the flow. Again, it's more interesting to look at the transient results. So here we've got them side by side with no braking and with the, the braking. And with no braking, you see that the flow is faster and it's a little more asymmetrical. There's more flow coming down on one side than the other. It goes up across the top surface or, uh, like in, in this way. And now, if you have inclusions coming with the flow, they, they can get sent down deep and trapped into the solidifying shell. Um, if the top surface velocities are too high, they can entrain mold slag, which also ends up in the final product. We get defects from that. As you can see, with the magnetic field, we've completely changed the flow pattern. So we've got a, a slower slow, uh, flow on, on the surface and, a bit, and slower below, so it's, it's less able to entrain inclusions. So that would be the more beneficial one. Still, we have the issues that if we uh, change our uh, situation, sometimes things can get unstable, and, and that's what we want to look for. So it's not just the, the transient situation, I'm sorry, not, not just the steady state, it's, it's these transient phenomena that, that we're really looking for. Again, we want to compare with measurements. In this case, we developed the method to get the velocity from simply dipping nails in the top surface. It solidifies the lump on the bottom. You can get from the angle of the lump, calibrate that to a velocity, and it's a quantitative measurement. And now there, there's our measurements are actually matching fairly well with our velocities. And we've explored a few different kinds of turbulence models, but it's, uh, it's very important to get these high fidelity simulations where we've got millions of degrees of freedom so that we can get a very accurate, simple, direct numerical simulation that we can then compare with these other turbulence models. So um, we wanted to check out our, our, our code on, on Blue Waters. Um, the, uh, the, the code in, in this solver, it's a, um, for, for, for the um, uh, Poisson equation solver, um, it's this uh, um, multi-grid, it's a, it's a geometric multi-grid, um, the V-cycle, and it's, it has this uh, um, red-black um, re relaxation method. And just for this test problem, um, we're, we're looking at comparing the CPU uh, on our workstation, the CPU on, on Blue Waters, the uh, GPU on the workstation, the GPU on Blue Waters, and um, there, Blue, Blue Waters is, is definitely out, out, outperforming our, our workstation. Um, it's also, uh, the, the GPU is greatly outperforming the CPU. So we've, we've got some pretty good success on, on that one. It's, uh, in terms of, of each processor, it's, it's like, like about double the speed, but the, the, the GPU code is, is 30, you know, tw 25 to 30 times faster. So um, we're, we're really uh, excited about the, the whole um, uh, impact of, of using the graphics processor instead of using the uh, CPU to do the, these calculations. Um, we need to do some more work to take advantage of the parallelism of, of Blue Waters. Um, one way is just to run different simulations on different processors. Uh, another way is if we can possibly use multiple processors, but we're, we're still working on, on that. Anyway, in conclusion, um, Blue Waters is a, a real tremendous resource um, for helping with, with these kinds of problems. We're, we've got our best success with the uh, commercial code Fluent 
it, which is really it's about 100 times speed up compared to a workstation. Um, I should point out that that's with our, our fixed grid wet method of doing the surface. If we, we, we developed a new moving grid method, which has some advantages for some problems, but it does not parallelize very well, so we didn't get the speed up. So you have to be very careful when you're working with these codes to, to get them so you can take advantage of, of the, the, the parallelism on, on blue waters. And, uh, we, and for our, our stress analysis code, it's not working very well at all. So we, we now know which codes and methodologies we can use to, to get some, some benefit out of the system. I'd like to acknowledge the funding from the steel companies that support this work. We've got 10 steel companies that support the Continuous Casting Consortium and the National Science Foundation. We've got um, two grants. And um, thanks for your attention. Yes? Would you be able to elaborate a little bit when you mentioned that you have uh, limitations of abacus with uh, parallelization and not be able to read multiple phases? So that's one by a little bit too quick with one. Line. Yeah, okay. Two, the, one, one issue at a, at a time. Not being able to read multiple phases. It, they have this input file which you read up in the manual, and, you, and we need to get the temperature field and the phase field have to get read in so that we can then do our simulation. And on Abacus Implicit, it works just as described in the manual. When you do that with Abacus Explicit, it, it somehow the, the information isn't going in. So it seems like a simple bug, which we have to work with Abacus on solving that one. Okay. So, but that, that pushes us over onto Implicit. The Explicit code, has the ability to you know, do, do stepping through um, it, it, very good parallelization because it's totally explicit and you get sort of free coupling of everything. And it's, it, it's been a lot of work for us to get that and now it's frustrating not to be able to use it. The, the implicit code, you can take bigger time steps theoretically, but as it turns out, they have to be small. But because there's coupling with everything, it just doesn't parallelize hardly at all. So that's why we're hoping to get the explicit one to work and then, then we can do what we want to do. Great question. Thanks. Yes. I notice your largest run is still pretty modest on blue water standards. Do you anticipate being able to scale your code up to ten, you know, hundreds, thousands of cores, tens of thousands of cores? I, I'm hoping that we can do, do some big, bigger problems. Right. Right now, we're at the testing stage, just to see if we can get things to go. But you're absolutely right. The capabilities are so much more than what we've uh, really done thus so far. Yeah, we're just sort of scratching the surface. We've only had a grant for uh, it's less than six months. Thank you.